Hello, everyone. It's Tuesday, November 15th. Today, I'll be talking with Larry Tentarelli of Blue Chip Daily, one of my favorite guests. Always brings some good charts to help us think. Stocks up, bonds up, choppy session. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller, Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in the markets using the power of stock charts. The technical toolkit is really designed to help us navigate uncertain markets, to focus on the message that the markets provide back to us in the form of price and trend and momentum breadth, sentiment, all those tools and techniques and indicators we can use to try to understand what, what's happening. It's been a pretty impressive run off of the October lows. Today, a spotty sort of choppy session as we had a news uh, from uh, from uh, Europe and, uh, and Russia uh, in, the, uh, in the middle of the day, which caused a, a bit of a drop. At the end of the day, sort of settling in just below 4,000. We're going to get to those charts here and quite a few more here in a few moments. Did want to let you know about the upcoming schedule. Larry Tensorelli joining us on the show today. Uh, tomorrow, we have Ryan Dietrich of Carson Financial Group. On Thursday, RRG Research's founder, Julius DeKempener, joining us. Next Tuesday, Ari Wald of Oppenheimer will be coming back on the show as well. Also wanted to highlight our latest episode of The Pitch is coming up this Friday. It's a fun opportunity to take three expert strategists, each pitching you five ideas, and then we discuss and debate those as a group. Go to stockcharts.com slash the pitch for all the info on that latest uh, episode and all of our previous discussions as well. Let's continue on our show today with our market recap. Let's take a sense of where things are at, how today's action fits into the big picture. What did we learn today about the overall trends in the market? To start with today's movements, the S&P finishing just below 4,000, around 3,992. That's up about 0.9% from yesterday, but it was indeed a choppy session. We had that sell-off right after lunchtime. It took us right about to the zero level before bouncing uh, a little bit higher. And again, just closing just below that 4,000 level, which could be an important one. We've talked about that level. Uh, that's a Fibonacci level. We'll talk about that uh, when we get to the chart of the S&P here in a few moments. Mid caps and small caps both outperforming the S&P today. And that small cap leadership sort of theme is an interesting one. I was talking with uh, today's guest, Larry Tentarelli, before we uh, launched the show. And uh, we'll talk about small caps in a little bit as well. One of those weird days today where the S&P, the NASDAQ both went higher and the VIX went up as well. We often think of those as having essentially a perfect inverse correlation, meaning when the S&P goes up 1%, the VIX goes down 1% and the opposite. It's actually not the case, right? The VIX is tied to the options market on uh, S&P uh, index options. And so there are certainly times based on the structure of those markets when the S&P and the VIX can go up together, when they can go down together. So uh, uncertainty increased uh, today in the form of volatility increasing. That is absolutely what today's session certainly felt like as a, uh, as a market participant and a market observer today. Bond markets rallied along with stocks. The TLT, the ag, were both up. The TLT was up 1.6%. That means uh, yields are down. And so the 10-year uh, yield down uh, to just below 380. Uh, now, obviously, this is down from around four and a quarter not too long ago. That's sort of the long-term uh, upside we've seen in uh, in the tenure, you know, a lot of discussion and debate as to whether or not we've seen the uh, you know the peak in in interest rates for now. I don't think so. Just given what the Fed is uh, planning to do here in December into the beginning of next year, I would expect rates to go higher from here. But we are certainly seeing a rally in bonds lining up with a reduction in uh, in interest rates. That sort of move, along with the weakening dollar, which we uh, saw a little more of today gives space for risk assets, particularly some of the FANG sectors to do a little bit better, which is what, uh, again, we saw today with some of the things like communication services and consumer discretionary, both having a pretty decent day. Mixed bag in commodities, gold a little bit up, silver a little bit down, a lot of other things sort of chopping around in the middle. Energy prices up a bit, and the energy sector uh, did just fine as well, about in the middle of the uh, of the pack for the 11 S&P sectors. Mixed on cryptos as well. Bitcoin up 1.5% from yesterday, uh, teased up to 17,000. Yesterday, again today, not quite getting above there. Now, this is well below the 20,000 level 
that we had talked about in recent weeks as being a sign of a recovery. Bitcoin briefly got above there. Then you have the whole debacle with FTX. And, um, you know, when one of the largest crypto exchanges goes under, that's certainly going to cause some instability in cryptocurrency prices. And that's what we're seeing uh, through the course of, uh, of this week for sure. Looking at a chart of the S&P 500, let's just talk about today's session and what it means. I've had this blue shaded area on my chart. And as a reminder of why this is an indicator, this is an area that we've highlighted, it's from a confluence of a number of different areas that all sort of focus in on the same uh, place. Now, first off, note that the rally in March on a closing basis was about 11% rise from the low, the low close in early March to the high close in late March. Similar measurement in June is about a 17, 17 and a half percent rally from uh, June to August. Right now, we're sort of in the middle of that, right? We've gone a little bit further than 11 percent, but not quite to 17 percent. And if we get up into that shaded area, which we've now done, kind of puts us in a similar trajectory to what we saw in uh, July and August. It actually go a little bit above there. I think it would go up to around 41, 41, 50, if I remember the exact uh, measurement. But overall, we're kind of getting to that area where we're having a similar rally to previous bear market rally. So I, I would argue if we we do label this a bear market rally, if we co feel confident with that sort of idea that this is a big downtrend channel and now we're at the upper end of that channel, kind of nearing the point when that would most likely start to reverse. Now, the other measurements we have here are Fibonacci retracement. So 4,000 is about a 61.8% retracement from the October low back up to the August high. So this is the 61.8% measurement there. 4,000 also represents a 38.2% retracement all the way back to the January high. So January's peak to October's low, 38.2% of the way is 4,000. So we have a couple different Fibonacci frameworks, I guess, uh, identifying this 4,000 level is pretty important. On top of that, we have the 200-day moving average currently around 4075. We have a trend line from the highs through the course of this year, currently around 4125. So a lot of overhead resistance. So is the rally in stocks encouraging? Absolutely. Have the breadth conditions improved to the point that it feels kind of optimistic? Definitely. Are we getting near the point where if this is a bear market rally, we may start to stall out? Yes. And this is why I think it's not 100% clear as to what is next from here. I could see either side. I could certainly see a, uh, a breakout and I could see uh, further deterioration. If I had to pick, I would probably think that this is a short-term move and that the long-term trend is still lower. I haven't seen enough uh, sort of change to confirm a long-term inflection point, but absolutely a short-term inflection point. One of the indicators that give me confidence in that sort of measurement would be this one. This is looking at the percent of stocks above key moving averages. Uh, looking at the S&P 500 members, what percent are above their 200-day? It's currently around 55% as of today's close. What percent are above their, uh, that's the 200-day, what percent are above their 50-day moving average? Just over 80%. So four out of five S&P stocks are above their 50-day, just like the S&P is. It's a broad rally. That's a pretty nice move. Note that that's kind of where we got to here in August when we hit the 200 day and again, uh, you know, sold off here. Uh, we got to around 90% of the S&P above their 50 day. That's a little bit above uh, current levels. What might be different is now over half of the S&P members are above their 200 day. That actually hasn't happened since April of this year. So this has certainly been a broad advance. It's not just a small number of stocks bouncing off of their October lows or, or their lows from the year. It's more and more stocks that are starting to uh, to improve. Just to finish off our market recap here, I wanted to highlight a name or two uh, sort of on the big movers list uh, and, and names that are, are earnings names that I think are worth paying attention to. This week, it's a lot of the big box retailers. You had Home Depot, um, uh, Walmart today. You've got Lowe's, Target all this week as well. So um, that's sort of the general earnings theme to this week and, and a bunch of other sectors peppered in there, to be honest with you. But when I look at the chart of Home Depot, Kind of encouraging in the fact that we've uh, had a low in June, we've retested that low essentially in September and October, and now starting to make a pattern of higher highs and higher lows, getting above the 200-day moving average for the first time since February. It's worth noting in August, we stalled at the 200-day, while the S&P has not quite gotten above its own 200-day moving average. You have individual names like uh, Home Depot actually being able to do so. Walmart with an even more uh, upward move, it would trade it as high as 150, just over there, settled down to around 147.40, but overall a gap higher. And this is after yesterday was a down close, bit of a downward move going into today's earnings release. Nice positive surprise, a nice gap higher from a technical perspective, I would argue, probably clears the way to previous highs. Let's take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with today's guest, Larry Tenterelli. We'll see you in a minute.
Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the final bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. We appreciate you joining us every weekday after the close as we try to make sense of these fascinatingly challenging markets in 2022. We're here along the ride with you to navigate these markets together and highlight some of the ways you can use technical analysis and the Stock Charts platform to hopefully make better informed decisions. A couple quick announcements before we get to today's guest, Larry Tentarelli. First off, we welcome your questions. We're going to do a mailbag segment a little later in today's show. We'll do another one at the end of the week. We'd love to feature one of your questions live on the air. Our email is thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. We are on Twitter at Final Bar SCTV. So give us a follow there. And on YouTube, subscribe to our Stock Charts YouTube channel. Put a comment below the video you're watching there. We'll gather all those questions. Hope to answer one of yours live on the air on Friday's show. Also, go to StockChartsTV.com. We are finishing up uh, Larry Williams' latest market outlook, which should be posted there uh, very quickly. Our previous episodes of The Pitch, a lot of fantastic guest experts like Larry Tentarelli and others worthy of your attention are all available at StockChartsTV.com or on your mobile device. Just search for Stock Charts TV on demand. I want to welcome on today's guest, Larry Tentarelli. Larry's the publisher of Blue Chip Daily Trend Report. Joining us from New Hampshire, Larry, great to see you. Welcome back to the show. Dave, thank you. It's great to see you and thank you for having me back on. So a fascinating uh, week among fascinating weeks. There's been a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, you know, sort of churning around, but overall netting out to a positive move. Talk us through the energy sector and where you're seeing some opportunities here. So we'll start. I brought two charts today. We're going to start with XOP, which is a general uh, energy sector ETF. It has Exxon, it has Chevron, but it also has some small caps and mid caps in there. And what I like about the chart is Dave, as you know, I like uptrends. And, and this is a very steady, we've got a couple of things. We've got four rising moving averages. XOP has been holding this 20 day nicely since October. So it broke above the, two, the 20 day in October and it's been holding at the 50 day. And it recently held a few times at the 20 day moving average. Also just from a pure, price level perspective, 145 to 150. If you look at the chart going back to April, it stalled at 145. Then in, in August, 152. September, 146. October, 146. And then it finally got a nice break above that 145 to 150 level Nice back test into that rising 20 day, and it's just drifting higher, very close to a potential breakout. It's a, a technically, it's a very strong chart, nice uptrend. One of the it's the leading sector year to date, as you know, in energy. And, and the way that it, it's trending right here, I think it's set up very well. I was taught that the most bullish thing the market can do is go up. And there's no doubt you see a nice uptrend above the all the moving averages, which really shows the consistency of that trend. Now right. we're going from old energy to more new energy. Talk to us about end phase. So we've we've got both sides of the energy coin covered and and very similar. So end phase is in a price base right now that dates back to August. But we've got a couple things. So we've got four rising moving averages 100 200 the 20 and the 50 are very very close as a matter of fact it looks like they may have crossed today which is bullish now this is a pretty wide range though so 270 and 320 if if we had a rectangular box we could draw that over 270 to 320 so it's it's in that range right now and I think if we get a, a strong breakout over 320 with a close over 320, I think that could open up the chart for, for a pretty nice breakout to the upside. It's interesting that you're coming on, Larry, and basically pitching two sides of energy. I think for a lot of people, they think of it as a binary outcome, right? It's like one or the other, right? You either like the clean energy names or you like the traditional energy names. Why do you feel confident thinking that there's opportunities on both sides of that coin here? Well, they're both in uptrends. So for <laughs> so for whatever reason, and end phase, they're in the technology sector. Mm. And it's it's one of the very, very few technology charts that's right near breaking out to new all-time highs. So if we take a look 
when the market melted down in September and October, they barely broke end phase below the 100-day moving average. So it held over a very wide price base. They've got very, very strong earnings growth. They're a profitable company. And the market's really, so clean energy overall has been very, very choppy. And a lot of those stocks have been in downtrends, but but Enphase appears to be the price leader. That with first solar, but I brought Enphase today because I, I like the way that this base is setting up. Now the key is it's going to need to hold over 270. So if, mm. if it starts to break down below 270, then that would start to invalidate the chart for me. And a close over 320, I think, could really open up the chart to the upside. That's great. 270 is right at the 100-day moving average on your chart, by the way, which is a which is a great level to uh, to pay attention to. You know, we only have about a minute left, Larry. But uh, you know, we were talking before um, the uh, the the show started just about the overall market conditions. I've been labeling this a bear market rally, and re have received some, let's say, heated feedback from some of our viewers at at, at at not calling this a raging bull market phase. Now that we've rallied so far off of the October lows, how are you thinking about now and year end? and what to expect. So I've been constructive, but I'm still treating it as a bear market rally until proven otherwise. So um, mm. I'm constructive. I've been buying stocks. We brought some charts today. But if we're talking only about the index, the, the area that you mentioned is very, very key. And, and I would expand it maybe to 42 to 43. If we get a strong seasonal year-end rally, which we could. We're in a strong time of year. The, the elections are over. But for me, it would need to get over that 4,300 previous high from August for me to think mm. that the coast is clear. So I, I'm going to say I'm cautiously optimistic, but I'm really curious to see what happens between 4,000 to 4,150. We're at an interesting juncture, I feel like, uh, yet again here in the markets. Larry, always a pleasure to talk to you. Great to see you. Stay safe there in New Hampshire, and we'll talk to you again soon. Dave, you too. Thank you so much. That's Larry Tentarelli. Larry is the editor, the founder of Blue Chip uh, Daily Report, coming to us from uh, from New Hampshire. Great take there overall. And I love that idea. You know, it's so funny when I talk to people, they almost imply that it's either or. You can't like the traditional oil names and like the clean energy names. Like, which side are you on? And and I love Larry's answers. Like, why, why do you think you can do both of those? Because the charts are going up. What a great answer for a technically oriented investor and a successful one is that uh, at that. Great take there from Larry Tensorelli, as always. Let's continue on our show today with the Final Bar Mailbag. As a reminder, the mailbag is always open. Email us at thefinalbar at stockcharts.com and let's get to question number one. Dave, I'm intrigued by the final chart in your mindful investor chart list. Similar look to July 2008, and the long-term trend looks pretty ominous. Your thoughts. So the chart you're referring to, I believe, and you included it in your question, thanks so much, is this one. This is the very end of my uh, my mindful investor live chart list. As a reminder, this is a list of charts that I share on stock charts. You're all uh, members can take these, save them, uh, you know, tweak them, do whatever you want with them. Um, if you've not seen this before, go to my articles page. So if you go to articles, go to uh, The Mindful Investor, which is my homepage. And at the top, you'll have a gray button that says live chart list. That'll get you to this chart, among many other really cool uh, charts to help you make sense of things. One of the things we've talked about, I've, I've been talking a lot with my premium members at Market Misbehavior about this as well, is I think historical analogs are, are, are compelling to a point. I think a lot of the value of technical analysis, particularly longer term analysis, is thinking about where we're at now relative to where we've been, right? What one of the common water cooler discussions we would have in my fidelity days and, and even to this day when I'm able to connect with someone else in the markets is, you know, what what does this remind you of, right? What historical period does this feel close to? Because it's always interesting to think about some of that anecdotal evidence about what something looked like or felt like and how that relates to what we're seeing now. I see a direct relationship now between two historical periods, as you alluded to in your question, uh, early 2016 and uh, late 2008. The big difference is kind of where we're at right now. Um, in 2008, and I, I agree with you, the ominous uh, sort of relationship, right? New high, hitting the 150-week, breaking down. The uh, RSI does a bullish divergence, but it doesn't work out. You have to look at what happens soon after. 
well before the March 09 low, six months plus earlier, you saw these things break down. You didn't see another buy signal from the PPO indicator. You saw the RSI break back below 40. All of that was an indication of a washout, you know, heading to a new bottom. The opposite happened in early 2016, where you didn't get those uh, negative signals. You actually got a buy signal from the PPO. You had the RSI get back above 50. Today, right? And again, I will look at this. Uh, it's a weekly chart. So I'll look at it on Friday's close. But if today was the end of the week, I'm getting a buy signal from the PPO and I'm getting the RSI just narrowly above 50, which means it's starting to look a lot more like the beginning of 2016. There's another historical analog to pay some close attention to. I don't know if we can repeat that subsequent five years, but it certainly would be encouraging in a struggling uh, bear market year of 2022. Thanks so much for your question, by the way. Next question, what is the difference between relative strength and the relative strength index or the RSI? That is a comment I've gotten uh, many times in my career, and I appreciate it so much. You know, again, Wells Wilder, uh, who's no longer uh, with us, uh, you know, wrote a pivotal work in the 1970s where he introduced to the world things like RSI and DMI, the ADX line, parabolic studies. Uh, Wells Wilder was 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 really uh, an incredible designer of technical indicators. So many that we uh, that we take for granted. If there was one thing I I wish he had done differently was not call the RSI RSI because it implies that it is relative to something else, which is not true, right? Relative strength index, the RSI, which I use all the time, is a measure of price momentum. If you know statistics, it's kind of like taking a Z score of the prices. It's normalizing the price movements and putting it on, you know, turning it into an oscillator that ranges from zero to 100. Um, the RSI is basically what are we doing now relative to what we've usually done for this particular stock or ETF or whatever ticker you run this on. So it's literally looking at the average up day and the average down day or over a particular look back window. And then it uses an exponential average to smooth that data out over time. But that's it. It's not relative to anything else. Relative strength, what we would call true relative strength, is the ratio that you see at the bottom, which is a ratio of the stock or the ETF you're looking at relative to some sort of benchmark. And you can do relative strength to a sector, to a broad benchmark, to another ETF, to a basket, whatever it is that you want to do. But relative uh, strength implies comparing this thing to other things and seeing if it's stronger or weaker. And you do it in a ratio. So if the line is going up, it's outperforming. If the line is going down, it's underperforming. So I have, this is my basic chart. I show it on the show all the time. I show it to my subscribers all the time. And it is the price at the top. It's price momentum, which is the RSI or the relative strength index at the bottom is relative strength, which is basically the strength of this security relative to other things. And again, sorry for the nomenclature. I didn't do it but I'll do my best to sort of clarify how those things are uh, are related. Thanks for that question as well. Next question, on Monday, November 14th, the graph of Netflix reveals there are three big gaps. Why do financial advisors say the gaps will be filled when there's a market reversal? That's a really interesting question. Let's look at the chart here. I'm guessing, so you didn't have a chart included. I'm guessing you're talking about these gaps here. I'm not, I'm not entirely certain, I'm sorry. Maybe you're talking about the gaps uh, back here. Um, but basically, you know, what when we when we think about price gaps, and I would encourage you on uh, stock charts, we have a section called Chart School. If you're ever struggling to make sense of a particular technique or market phenomenon, uh, click on Chart School, or just go to the magnifying glass and type in the keywords of what you're looking at. So if you look for gaps, you'll find a bunch of articles. Um, you know, not just Chart School articles that are meant to teach you about how to use gaps, but also a lot of our commentators. Will refer to price gaps in their uh, in their articles. That can help you get some real world examples recently of where they've come into play. It's a common technique to look at price gaps as sort of an anchor point, right? So when Netflix was selling off, you have a couple of these big price gaps. This was during earnings when it was really uh, you know going down and really under severely underperforming the uh, the S and P as you can see over the six month period. Those gaps we often talk about filling the gaps because a lot of times when there's a gap. As I said, that's sort of an anchor point. That is where something changed. That is where the valuation changed abruptly from one day to the next. On an equity chart, it usually has to do with some news event, um, you know, some big change, often an earnings report, a management change, a, a takeover, something like that. A capital structure change would uh, would change the valuation overnight. But those gaps are often interesting uh, sort of pivot points or magnets to price action going forward. So when you're looking to the left on a chart, just like you would look for traditional support and resistance level, I would also look for price gaps because more often than not, 
they have meaning. As an example of that, look at the lower end of this gap in April. Look at how that lined up with the August peak and look at how that also lined up with this subsequent gap in October before we retested that same level. That's all around 250. And I think that all comes from that gap down in April. That is your question on, uh, or that, that is the answer to your question on on, uh, on gaps, we often talk about filling the gaps or, or basically gravitating to that magnet price of uh, that that uh, change in valuation that a gap represents. Again, if you want more info on that, click on the magnifying glass type uh, price gaps or just gaps and you'll find, you'll probably find the ticker for gap GPS, but you'll also find some articles on price gaps and I'd point you there for sure. We need to wrap the show. The mailbag, the show goes so quickly, but it's a pleasure to address your questions. Keep them coming. But we need to wrap to today's show by going to the three in three, three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Here's chart number one, Home Depot in the news today because of earnings. Decent up day, uh, outperformed the market up 1.6% while the S&P was uh, up a little less than that. That's encouraging. What's more encouraging when I think about my conversation with uh, with Larry Tensorelli about, you know, labeling this a bear market rally, I, I would agree with his take. I think that was very well said. I'm recognizing the strength off of the lows in September and October for a lot of individual names. I still haven't seen enough to make it 100 percent obvious that this is a new bull market phase. I just haven't seen enough um, to uh, to define it that way. I think if you have by now, you're probably jumping the gun a little bit in terms of recognizing that we haven't had that much of an improvement yet on a lot of names. However, more and more individual stocks are breaking out. I talked about the breadth conditions earlier, how a lot of stocks are above their 50-day and a ton of them uh, above their 200-day as well. But if you also look at a trend line analysis, here's the January peak in Home Depot. Here's the August peak in Home Depot. You can see that over the last week, we've now broken above that trend line and now pulled back and retested it. Today, you actually pulled back in on intraday basis just to that trend line and now rotating back to the upside. We're also now above the 200-day moving average for the first time since February. More and more individual names that do what Home Depot is doing, which is rotating, I think, pretty clearly from a distribution phase to a consolidation phase, and now potentially breaking out. I think that's more and more encouraging. What would I? What would it take for me to really get excited about Home Depot? It'd be a break above 330. That would take us above, above the uh, August highs. That's similar to what Larry and I were talking about with the S&P 500 as well. Chart number two is the Russell 2000 ETF, ticker IWM. Uh, before we went live with the show, I was chatting with Larry about a couple different things, and he pointed out the strength in small caps. One of the main risk-on, risk-off measures I've always looked at is small caps, right? In a bull market phase, small caps tend to outperform. In a bear market phase, small caps tend to struggle. Now, it didn't work particularly well in 2001, late 2020, when it was more of a FANG mega cap led rally. But in general, if you look back in market history, it's been a pretty tried and true approach to things. That chart of Home Depot just broke above trendline resistance. When I draw a similar line for the Russell 2000 ETF, we're right about there, which is why I feel like this week, while I feel like this month is pivotal, because this could be the week, the month where we get that breakout, where more and more names, more and more tickers are breaking above their 200-day and following through. More and more of these names are breaking above key trend lines and following through. That is a condition we've not seen yet in 2022. And I think it's worth noting, strength in small caps usually should make you feel pretty good about upside potential for stocks. Chart number three, why are stocks and other risk assets able to rally? A lot of that, I would argue, has to do with interest rates, has to do with the U.S. dollar. And one of the ways we've talked about dollar sign TNX, the 10-year yield, we've talked about the USD, uh, dollar sign USD, the dollar index coming off of, uh, of long-term highs. Let's flip some of those over and look at the chart of AG, which is a uh, an aggregate bond ETF. So this includes treasury bonds and corporate bonds. Just a beautiful bullish momentum divergence, lower lows uh, in price September into October, higher lows in momentum. That often indicates an upside rotation. We're now back above the 50-day due moving average, making a higher low rotating to the upside. Rates coming off, bond prices appearing to go higher. Folks, that's a wrap for the show. Thanks so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. Special thank you to Larry Tentarelli joining us from uh, New Hampshire and uh, Blue Chip Daily. Great take on the markets and some great ideas in the energy space. For StockCharts.com and Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Have a great night. We'll see you tomorrow. Hey, Grayson Rhodes here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below, maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.